So now we're going to continue on and talk about hold time. And we're going to actually talk about the, the data required time. And what this is, is what at what point can the source flip-flop actually um, start changing its output again? Um, what is the required time in which we need to hold our signal stable to? We don't know when we need to start, but we know when we need to have our signal held stable until a certain point. That certain point is called the data required time. And that is basically the clock arrival time, so clock insertion point, plus the skew, plus the native intrinsic hold inside for this flip-flop. So we must have, register one must provide a stable input by this period, this time, the latch edge, and it must be held until the data required time. <coughs> so let's see if we can't examine this from a circuit perspective. So when we take the entire circuit into account, we have data delay, we have clock delay, and we have intrinsic hold. So our clock is skewed, and that means the clock arrives that much later, which, if you think about it, means that we have to hold our signal that much longer. So clock skew, unlike in setup, doesn't do us any favors right now. It actually causes us some problems. So clock delay plus the intrinsic hold time minus the data delay. Now let's think about why the data delay is subtracted. The reason we subtract data delay here is because the longer it takes the data to arrive here and change, that means the longer after that clock edge, it'll stay stable until the next value comes in. So what happens is the data delay actually works in our favor in terms of hold timing. This is just a quick example to show you how setup and hold might look in a real flip-flop to flip-flop scenario. So in this sense, we have two flip-flops, clock one, uh, clocked by clock one, and clock two. Data in feeds in, but as you can see, it doesn't change until slightly after the clock edge. This is to represent the clock to queue delay native to these flip-flops, or all flip-flops. And we see that the data also takes an additional period in which to be sampled by the input of this flip-flop. There's an additional one nanosecond of propagation delay. And that value is not represented until sometime after the clock edge, that is the clock to queue of our destination flip-flop. So you'll see our hold time requirement might actually be met by our clock to queue delay. Again, let's start adding some formalism to this. So when we're trying to figure out if we have any hold slack, we need two elements here. We need to know when the data actually arrives. Okay, we need to know at what point will the data arrive at this flip-flop. And again, it's pretty basic, we're, but we're actually looking at the fastest the input can toggle, right? Because if the input can toggle fast, that means it might change right after the clock edge, which means it might not necessarily meet our hold timing. So, for example, our input takes one nanosecond, and it might take 0.802 nanoseconds to get through the logic cloud. Uh, and then what happens is you'll see the signal, the actual input, 1.814 nanoseconds later. Now let's consider the actual data arrival time on a register to register scenario. So here we're actually just looking at the clock paths. We consider that whenever the clock arrives, the data has to arrive. So we're going to consider the, uh, the, the latching point to be when data arrives. Now the thing is that means we actually have to take into account when the clock enters our design and when it actually arrives at the flip-flop. So source clock edge plus source clock path delay. That tells us when the data arrives at this flip-flop. Now that we know when the data arrives, if it's from an input to register scenario or a reg to reg scenario, now we need to know how long does that signal need to be held past the clock edge for us to meet timing. Well, we already kind of talked about this a few slides back. But again, let's add some, formal, like some formalism to this math 
we have a clock edge. So the clock edge, so the exact time, not the delay, the exact time in which that the this clock edge actually occurs plus the destination to the delay for the clock to arrive there plus the hold. So what that means is from the clock edge arriving here we have to hold the signal out to the required hold time. We have to hold it out that much longer and that tells us our required stability time or rather our required hold time. Let's see if we can't look at a graphical representation of this. So again, the same equation, um, but with sort of more pictures, if you will. So we have our clock network delay. So our clock arrives, our clock edge is here. There's a destination clock path delay, clock network delay, so it actually arrives here. Now we have our hold time. So remember, our actual data arrival time is Basically, we, we can think of it as the time in which the data is stable, or rather it arrives, or it, it, what happens is the data takes some period of time before it actually can change, um, or we see the new value at our destination register. It's safe enough to assume that we can just take our clock to queue um, and use that as when does the data change. So it'll take exactly some finite period called clock to queue for this register to change its output. So we know we have a stable input D up until this point in time, until clock to queue has been satisfied from the source flip-flop. That means that since we met this hold time and the input hasn't changed until here, the input for our destination flip-flop hasn't changed here, we have this much more time that the signal was held stable that it really didn't have to be. That's our hold slack. That means we are actually holding our our input signal to this destination flip-flop that much longer than actually need be. Let's take a look at a, a by the numbers example. So we know when our data arrives and we know how long our, our data has to be stable. So from that we know that we have this much leftover slack in our hold. So the more slack, the better. Um, means maybe we're not tightly constraining our design or not constraining it enough. Um, not a problem. Hold timing typically isn't too much of an issue uh, in our designs, but occasionally it crops up, so we need to understand what it is. But in this example, we're saying our data path delay is 800 picoseconds. Our hold constraint is 1 nanosecond. Our source clock arrives at 8 nanoseconds, that's the fastest it will arrive, and it takes 0.2 nanoseconds to actually hit this flip-flop. Um, and then we look at this flip-flop and it says, you know what, this one takes 20 nanoseconds. This, 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 this flip-flop, this clock edge actually arrives at 20 nanoseconds relative to this flip-flop, and it's skewed by 0.5 nanoseconds. So let's think about that here. And we're going to kind of look at this in a slightly backwards fashion. What that means is, we're going to look start down here. We have our destination clock. Our destination clock says that our input, our, our, our destination clock signal will arrive at 2 nanoseconds. Okay, and we know that it's going to take um, 5 nanoseconds of clock skew. So we know that our input signal arrives around 20.520 nanosecond. I mean our clock edge arrives around 20.520 nanoseconds. Now what they say is relative to that clock edge our data signal must be held for exactly one nanosecond or approximately one nanosecond. So our data signal seems to be pretty solid. So it looks like we probably met that hold requirement. It doesn't appear to be changing. So it has to be held that long. So let's look at what possibly could change that data signal. Well it's going to be something happening on the next source clock edge. So what that is is we have our next our source clock flip-flop which triggers at 8 nanoseconds and has a clock buffer skew of 2 picoseconds so that our clock basically arrives at our source flip-flop at 8.004 nanoseconds. Well from that clock edge arriving there's going to be a minimum data delay. Let's call this clock to skew. That means it'll take exactly 
800 picoseconds for the input on the D-pin of the flip-flop to toggle to the output Q of the source flip-flop. That means our data signal, our output of the source flip-flop, is stable for yet another 800 picoseconds. That means our the source flip-flop actually sees the input data arrive at around 8 nanoseconds. So what we do is we say, okay, well, fine, our data changes here, and we were stable up until here. Uh, we, we held up until we held uh, up until here until the requirement. The requirement said we had to be we had to hold until 3.556 nanoseconds, or 3.566 nanoseconds. And so we say, okay, well, did we hold longer than we needed to? Well, yeah, we held longer than we held by 8 nanoseconds minus 3.556 nanoseconds. We held 5 nanoseconds over the required hold time. So we actually ended up with uh, 5 nanoseconds of hold slack, extra hold time. That means our design is good. We don't have any issues. So to bring this back, what we have here is we have um, the, we have basically not all paths are going to be consume the entire clock period. That means we have positive slack and not all paths actually can be solved during the entire clock period. We have negative slack. But the general equation here for hold slack is going to be the shortest actual time, meaning the um, shortest actual hold time being met, minus our hold requirement, gives us our, our basically what our, our slack or our hold critical path is. And here, let's just say this was the shortest slack we've seen in our design, meaning the other ones actually held it for longer, um, we would actually say that our hold slack is going to be 5 nanoseconds, which means our critical path in terms of hold timing was 5 nanoseconds positive slack. So there's nothing to worry about because positive slack means our timing requirements have been met. So um, negative slack is what we have to worry about. It means we've missed the timing requirements for hold.